There are some people who would get tired of being placed in charge of SCP-914 or the clockworks. The monotony of it all might make most of us go mad. The same routine, day after day, placing an infinite number of objects into the intake booth of the machine, selecting one of the modes, be it rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or very fine, and seeing just what sort of transformation takes place. But there was one employee of the SCP Foundation who liked that routine just fine. Dr. Gears was happy with his position. The simplicity of the routine, the predictability of it all. He liked when the days stacked neatly together in a row of uneventful stretches of time. It was why he ate the exact same meal for lunch every day, a plain turkey sandwich on white bread, a cup of water, and a single banana. Of course, there was some variety in the events that came about when testing the clockworks. There was that incident with Dr. Curtis and the pound of bacon placed inside the machine alongside a photograph of SCP-682. It had resulted in a miniature replica of SCP-682 made entirely out of bacon, capable of movement, and extremely hostile. Though its size prevented it from doing any damage, it did still attempt to kill any staff it could find. It had smelled mouthwatering. But Dr. Gears had suspended Dr. Curtis from testing with SCP-914 for the trouble, and a day of having bacon grease cleaned off of every surface in the vicinity. There was also the incident that occurred when Dr. Hertz, in an attempt to score some free music production, placed a CD of his own original guitar songs into the machine on the setting Very Fine. Rather than improving the production quality of the tracks on the CD, the machine produced a completely silent CD as well as a collection of books on songwriting, singing, and playing the guitar for beginners. Dr. Gears had to physically drag Dr. Hertz from the room when, upset by the blow to his ego, he attempted to attack the machine. And, of course, there had been the highly destructive Super Bouncy Ball incident, which resulted in 45 casualties and staggering damage to the facility, as well as the aforementioned ball, which was currently thought to be somewhere in space most likely orbiting Mars. But for the most part, it was always the same thing. An object went in, a setting was selected, and the object came out in a new, modified state. Wash, rinse, repeat, just like it said on the back of the bottle of the brand of unscented shampoo Dr. Gears had been using for the past 30 years. That was how he liked it. And as he sat at his desk, going over the test logs and preparing to supervise another round of tests, he turned on some of his favorite tunes. Well, I say tunes, but it was really a white noise machine. He didn't care for music. It was a bit too much excitement. He was just getting into the flow of his work when there was a knock at his office door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. A research assistant was standing at the door, pale and anxious, a clipboard in his hands. They're, um, requesting your help with an emergency down the hall. What is it? Dr. Gears asked. They didn't really say, just something about Dr. Bright and, um, <clears throat> chainsaws? The assistant stammered. Dr. Gears sighed and stood up from his desk. I'll be right there. There wouldn't be anyone keeping an eye on SCP-914, but at this point, the experimentation process basically ran itself. Everything would be fine if Dr. Gears stepped away for a little while, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, across the site, a very enterprising mask became keenly aware of an opportunity presenting itself. It had been lying in wait, meticulously planning and plotting for days. And now, there was an opening it could take advantage of. You see, months ago, the mask had managed to finagle itself a host, a researcher who had just been working with SCP-914. When the mask's consciousness took over the man's and it delved into all of his thoughts as they were snuffed out one by one, it learned all about the marvelous, miraculous clockworks. The machine, capable of transforming anything into a better version of itself. The mask had fantasized, obsessed about getting to SCP-914, of using it to mold itself, to change into something greater and more powerful. Then, perhaps, it could escape this place and return to its former freedom and glory. Of course, it would have to select the right setting, one wrong choice, and the whole plan could amount to nothing. On rough, the mask would likely be destroyed, reduced to a pile of ceramic dust or perhaps even a ball of unmolded clay, alongside some of the black slime always oozing from its eyes and mouth. 
On course, it would likely be transformed into a slab of plain porcelain, uncarved and unpainted. On one-to-one, -one, the mask would likely be swapped out with another anomalous object, some other enterprising mask, or perhaps a haunted Victorian doll or some other malicious inanimate thing. And what use would that be? No, that wouldn't do at all. Fine could be promising, and would likely prevent the mask from degrading any future hosts it decided to take. But why stop there? Why should it limit itself to simply fine, when very fine was right there and looking oh so promising? It decided if it could get to SCP-914, it would find a way to transform itself using the very fine setting. And then, its enemies, this pathetic foundation, the entire world would fall to their knees. It had been waiting patiently, like a snake coiled and ready to snap up its prey, spreading its psychic tendrils as far as they could go, and anticipating the moment that someone left SCP-914 unattended. Huh. Now, the moment had arrived. Of course, the mask would need help. It didn't have a way to reach the clockworks on its own. So it had been wrapping its influence around the guard station just outside its door, dripping thoughts into his head, whispering darkness into his ear at every chance it got, chipping away at his will bit by bit until the man was little more than a puppet with the possessive mask tugging at his strings. The mask gave a mental yank on one of those strings, calling the man in its thrall into the room. First, he knocked out his fellow guard with the butt of his gun. At this point, his mind was so pliable that he would do anything to please the mask. Next, the man entered the containment chamber, a glassy, vacant look in his eyes. He unlocked the glass case and reached inside, lifting the mask out and bringing it one step closer to absolute freedom. He tucked the mask inside of his uniform, hiding it away from any prying eyes and began to walk steadily towards SCP-914's room. All the while, the mask whispered silent encouragements into the man's weakened mind, promising him power and success beyond his wildest dreams, if only he would help it achieve this goal. Of course, the mask was planning to kill the man as soon as his task was done, but he didn't need to know that yet. Every step brought the mask closer to victory, and it was practically vibrating with the delicious anticipation of it all. Soon, so soon, they reached the containment room, the clockworks just beyond the door. The guard carried the mask into the room, placed the mask inside of the intake booth, closed it, and approached the control panel. In accordance with the mask's psychic instructions, he selected very fine and turned the machine on. The cogs and gears inside whirred to life, the engine sputtered, metal clanked, and pipes exhaled, hissing bursts of energy. The output chamber opened, and through the curtain of steam, SCP-035 stepped in its new and improved form. That's right, stepped. First, one long, sinewy leg, leathery, shiny, and black as the night, extended into view. Another leg followed, and along with it came a torso, a pair of arms, a slender neck, and the familiar face of the mask, stark white against the darkness of its new body. The feet ended in little points, as if the figure was wearing boots, but there was no visible clothing. It was all one being, angular and strange, with long, long fingers tipped with curved claws. The mask let out a wicked cackle, throwing back its head in triumph. <laughs> Excellent. It's even better than I imagined. The mask turned to the guard that had helped it escape. Thank you for your service. Now I have one last favor to ask you. It was time for the mask to test its powers, to see how the clockworks had strengthened what was already there, what more it was capable of in this enhanced state. I want you to go into the cafeteria, walk into the kitchen, and climb into the oven, would you? Make sure you turn it on nice and hot first. It waited for a few seconds before the man nodded solemnly, turned and left the room, heading off in the direction of the cafeteria. It listened as the moments passed, and the sound of horrified, shocked screams rang out, and it knew that the man had followed its instructions exactly. 
At the mask's orders, he had cooked himself for lunch. The mask clapped its hands together, cackling again. <laughs> wonderful, oh wonderful. Now that's taken care of, what shall I try next? If the mask had eyebrows, they would have been arched in a truly devilish expression. First, it wanted to test its abilities on a truly formidable opponent, someone worthy of the mask's time and attention. Casually as you please, it strode over to one particular containment chamber to see about an unkillable reptile. As it walked, several guards took notice, pointing their weapons at the mask and ordering it to stand down. Each time it chuckled, and with a wave of its hand, the barrels of their guns warped and twisted into little metal bows, completely useless. It snapped its clawed fingers, and the guards fell to the ground in an unconscious heap. Can't have you sounding the alarm yet. The fun is only just beginning, the mask remarked, though it knew the guards couldn't hear it. It kicked open the door to SCP-682's containment room with a jaunty greeting. <laughs> Hello, you scaly fool. I come to pay you a visit. The reptile did not respond, incapacitated by its hydrochloric acid bath. That just wouldn't do. The mask concentrated, and the steel chamber broke apart, acid spilling everywhere, hissing as it splashed onto any available surface. SCP-682 lifted its head, twitching its tail, and took in the sight of the new and improved mask. What do you think? The mask posed for the creature laughing again. It seemed it couldn't stop laughing lately, its expression fixed into a permanent, gleeful smile. It couldn't help it. Freedom and power just felt so good. Disgusting. SCP-682 remarked, unimpressed with this display. It lunged at the mask, preparing to attack, but the mask held up a hand to stop it. Not so fast. SCP-682 suddenly froze in place, eyes rolling wildly as it tried desperately in vain to move. Let's see. What should I do with you? The mask was itching to test out its reality warping abilities. It had the feeling that there was very little it couldn't do in this state, and wanted to see just how far its power could go. But what would be suitable punishment? What could be the cruelest possible thing to do to such a creature? The mask could simply try to kill it, to finally snuff out this endless, miserable life. But that would be a release. That would be far too easy. Aha. Uh -huh. A light bulb went off in the mask's twisted mind. Perfect. It waved its hand, releasing SCP-682 from its paralysis, but as the massive lizard snapped its jaws and moved to take a bite out of the mask, it lost its balance, falling to the ground. Its legs had begun to shrink, rapidly knocking its center of gravity askew. Soon the rest of its body began to follow, getting smaller and smaller at an unbelievable pace, until finally, where there had once stood a massive, impossible prehistoric beast was something resembling a baby alligator. A tiny little tail thrashing about, short stubby legs, bulbous eyes, and a mouth full of sharp but adorable, non-threatening teeth. When the shrunken SCP-682 spoke, its voice was high-pitched and squeaky. It roared. Yes, you are. The mask turned and left, thoroughly pleased with its work and shut the door behind it. Now, what other fellow anomalies could the mask exercise its absolute superiority over? It pondered other supposedly dangerous and deadly entities that it had heard about over its time in Foundation custody. It all seemed so… laughable now. There was only one true danger within these walls, and it was the mask. Oh. What about that abominable sculpture? The ugly thing with a pension for snapping necks, but only when a person wasn't looking at it. The absolute coward. Cowards didn't deserve to live, the mask decided, and it made its way over toward SCP-173's containment cell. Inside, there were several D-Class staring at the statue with wide, unblinking eyes, each person terrified of being the one to let their guard down and lose their life in the process. None of them would die today, however. At least, not at the hands of the statue. As the D-Class in the cell watched, never once taking their eyes off of SCP-173, the statue's head began to twist and rotate, 
the sound of cracking snow and creaking metal reverberating through the room. The mask used its telekinetic abilities to rend the statue's head from its neck, relishing the irony of breaking the thing's neck just as it had done to so many others. It wasn't about justice, of course. The mask had no taste for such insipid and human things. It just found the whole image quite funny. The entire thing began to crumble apart, like a sandcastle beneath an ocean wave, disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of pebbles and dust. Just like that, SCP-173 was no more. As for the D-Class in the cell, well, the mask could use some servants. You all, come with me, the mask ordered, flexing its iron will and quickly capturing the weak, fear-addled minds of the D-Class personnel before it. They fell in line, shuffling out the door and following the mask with the same blank expressions as the guard before. Whatever was left of their personalities after so much time being used and abused by the Foundation, it was gone now, replaced only with the will of the Mighty Mask. As the Mask continued its victory tour of the Foundation, now with four mindless servants in tow, it passed the staff break room. Through the window it spotted one Dr. Bright, the telltale amulet around his neck, <laughs> microwaving some leftover pizza. The Mask had always found Dr. Bright distasteful, with the self-aggrandizing pranks and general dedication to chaos with no grand vision behind it, no meaningful agenda. It was pitiful, it was deeply ugly, and now the mask had a chance to put an end to the immortal doctor's antics once and for all. It opened the door, greeting Dr. Bright with that frozen grin. Oh, doctor. Dr. Bright's eyes widened, and he didn't even hear the microwave behind him ding, signaling that his pizza was ready. He was too distracted by the horrifying sight before him, but as he opened his mouth to scream, to call for help, the mask reached out and ripped the amulet from his neck. The host body fell limply to the ground, and the mask looked down at the amulet, glinting in the light that held Dr. Bright's consciousness inside. It stared at the amulet with a flinty gaze, and under its empty stare, the metal began to rust, to degrade, and to melt into an unrecognizable slurry. The mask let it drip onto the floor, then when all that was Dr. Bright had melted away, it wiped its hand off with a napkin and ground the wet puddle on the ground with its heel. Goodbye, doctor, the mask hissed. Now, what's next? But as the mask turned to walk down the hall, it came face to face with a disapproving face. SCP-343 had manifested directly in front of the mask, and he clearly had learned of the mask's behavior so far that day. You've been busy. <laughs> yes, very busy. Lots to do, you see. The mask chuckled smugly. You understand why I can't allow this to continue, right? 343's expression remained stern but calm. You believe you can stop me? The mask tilted its head to the side. Of course I can. SCP-343 sighed. But you can stop on your own, if you would rather. I prefer to avoid an unnecessary conflict. The mask giggled uncontrollably at this. <laughs> I am going to rend the flesh from your bones, it simply said. I thought you might say something like that. I'm going to have to take your body. I'm sorry. SCP-343 prepared to teleport the mask's new body to another location, separating them and reducing the mask to its original, more manageable state. But before he could, there was sudden darkness in the room, every light blinking out all at once. The hall was plunged into shadow, but this was no ordinary darkness. This darkness was inky, thick, cloaking like smoke clinging to the inside of your throat. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the darkness dissipated, but SCP-343 was gone. He hadn't teleported himself to somewhere else. He hadn't walked through the wall to get away from the mask. He was truly gone. The mask couldn't be certain exactly what it had done to SCP-343, but it knew that the enemy had been truly eradicated. In fact, it was fairly certain he had been erased from reality entirely. 
The mask made one final lap around the Foundation containment site, bidding farewell to every anomaly it passed. Some it transformed like it had done to SCP-682. Taking inspiration from its bird-like face, the mask turned the Plague Doctor into a crow. Others it simply executed, such as the poor SCP-096, whose screams and shrieks had always irritated the mask. Of course, the Foundation began to notice what was happening, and they tried to defeat the mask. They shot at it with their puny weapons, they sounded their useless alarms, and they called for their laughable backup. But none of it mattered, not in the face of the mask. Guns melted in guards' hands, alarms went silent at nothing more than a glance, and more and more mindless slaves joined the mask's army. It didn't want too many. That would just be difficult to keep track of, but an even dozen seemed like the perfect number. With this miniature army in tow, the mask finally made its way to its final destination, the exit. It had been waiting for this moment, dreaming of it, since it was first imprisoned so long ago. As it stepped out into the sun, the mask realized that, though it didn't have nostrils, it could smell the breeze, the scent of wildflowers and grass. What a beautiful place to mold into the mask's image of an ideal world. The world was its oyster, and the mask longed to swallow it whole. The current whereabouts of the possessive mask are unknown. The Foundation is doing its best to locate the mask, and determine new effective measures for bringing it down and recontaining it as soon as possible. The escape of the mask is being considered a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, if it cannot be stopped. The best and brightest minds at the Foundation are working on it, Aside from Dr. Bright, of course, may he rest in peace. But right now, there is very little anyone can do. So if you see a strange dark figure in a white mask walking down the street, do yourself a favor and run the other way before it's too late. Now go check out Could SCP-682 Be Contained in the Back Rooms? and SCP-096 vs. Siren Head for more terrifying anomalous hypotheticals.